Um, our next speaker is presenting the slide that you see up here, the forgotten Admiral, Vice Admiral Sir Alexander Cochrane, a subject that contributes significantly to the topic of this historical symposium. And it's coming from a person who for years now, I think all four years, right? For three years now has contributed significantly to the content of this historical symposium. Sam Cavill is an LSU graduate, so don't let the accent fool you. She did a master's degree at LSU, but then she received her doctorate in Naval and Maritime History from the University of Exeter in the United Kingdom. She is a leading authority on the topics that will come up today, and she has a magnificent publication if you get an opportunity to purchase the book, Quarterdeck Boys and, and Midshipmen in the British Navy. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Sam Cavill. Well, thank you, Marty, and thanks everyone for being here once again. Well, I feel like this is coming at a good time considering what we just heard from Colonel Humans about this man. Um, so let's take a look at the uh, man who masterminded the 1814 campaign for the South, which would culminate in the attack on New Orleans, and that's, of course, Vice Admiral Sir Alexander Cochrane. Now, we've been talking about Cochrane here at this conference for many years now, but what do we actually know about him, about him personally and professionally? Was he this rash, xenophobic monster, this devil? Or was he a really clear-headed and skilled professional with a conscience? What I can tell you is what some of his more vocal contemporaries thought about him, and this is what Colonel Humans alluded to. Uh, this is a comment from <laughs> the Earl St. Vincent. Okay, now he was First Lord of the Admiralty from 1801 to 1804. And he was a really colorful character, very, very vocal. He had this to say about the family. The Cochrans are not to be trusted out of sight. They are all mad, romantic, money-getting, and not truth-telling, and there is not a single exception in any part of the family. Okay? And then, of course, we had Pakenham uh, and the issue with him. And the Duke of Wellington had this to say after the Battle of New Orleans. I cannot but regret that he, Pakenham, was ever employed on such a service with such a colleague. The Americans were prepared with an army in a fortified position which still would have been carried if the duties of others, that is of the Admiral, Cochrane, had been as well performed as that of he whom we now lament. Now, th these are not very glowing personal or professional testimonials to a man who was entrusted with a really important job of being CNC, Commander in Chief of the North America Station in 1814, okay? So these opinions, and mind you, it should be noted that both the Duke of Wellington and St. Vincent were strong political rivals to Cochrane. And that meant a lot in those days, just like it does today. It was, it was a bitter political rivalry at the time. And that could be the source. And also, Wellington lost his brother-in-law during all of this. So we need to think about these opinions versus the fact of his career and the really important position that he was placed in and dig a little deeper to look at what made him tick and what set him on the path to New Orleans with such a dogged single-mindedness. So let's start where most stories do with um, family and uh, childhood. Well, Alexander was part of the Cochrane clan, okay, of Scotland. Now, you have to know that there have been a lot of really famous and infamous Cochrans in naval history, in Brit British naval history. Uh, and uh, <laughs> he was just one of them, okay. He was the sixth surviving son of Thomas Cochrane, the eighth Earl of Dundonald. Now, the Dundonalds were actually uh, representative peers, which meant that they were a noble family who was eligible to sit in the House of Lords in the British Parliament. And very, very few noble families of Scotland and Ireland had that privilege. So this family had the pedigree and they had the power, 
but they were absolutely skint. Okay? They were completely penniless, like a lot of Scottish and Irish nobility. They didn't have the money to back up the power, so the power would only go so far. Now, Thomas Cochrane, Alexander's father, is not to be confused with Thomas Cochrane, Alexander's nephew, who became the 10th Earl of Dundonald. And this man was a huge, larger-than-life character in British naval history, especially of the Napoleonic Wars. He had many, many amazing exploits that he wrote about in his autobiography of a seaman. And so much so that he became the basis of the characters of both Captain Jack Aubrey in the Patrick O'Brien novels, the Master and Commander series, and Horatio Hornblower in the C.S. Forrester novels. That's how big of a deal he was. But it was also controversial because later in his career he ends up being indicted for fraud in Parliament and then after that he's exonerated. So he's a colourful and interesting character. Not to be outdone though was um, uh, Alexander's older brother Archibald, the heir, who had become the ninth Earl. Now, Archibald tried stints in both the army and the navy as a young man and was an abject failure at both. Um, he then turned his hand to invention, coming up with, among other things, a patent for coal tar. And while well, the product was actually really good, it didn't sell well. So he ends up losing what little is left of the family's fortune on these, on these inventions. And he also ends up losing the family estate of Culross Abbey uh, in Scotland. So this is a real disaster. This is who Alexander Cochrane has to deal with as family. Now, what happens when you've got a penniless uh, nobility, family of nobility? Well, basically, it didn't actually affect uh, Alexander all that much as a young man because there was a law of primogenitor in England which meant that the all the wealth of the estate, the money and the land, had to go whole to the eldest son and heir. It couldn't be divided up among younger sons. So what that meant was, for as long as England has stood, that the younger sons of nobility, whether they were rich or poor, had had to go out and make their own way in the world. They had to make their own careers. If you were wealthy, that meant you went into the army because you could buy a commission and automatically become a very grand officer. If you didn't have money, it meant you went into the Navy because at no time in the Navy's history could you buy a commission. You had to start from scratch, work your way up, and eventually make it to the examination for lieutenant. Okay? And this is exactly what Cochrane does. He heads off into the Navy at about age 14, around 1772, and he's sent out to the West Indies uh, under Admiral Rodney's squadron out there. Now, the West Indies is well known as a place to go if you want rapid promotion, okay? Part of the reason is that people are dying off pretty quickly uh, from tropical diseases, among other things. And he heads out, he does really well. He passes his examination for lieutenant at the age of 20, uh, which is the earliest time you could take it, the youngest age you could take it. And he gets to participate in actions that are surrounding the American Revolutionary War, with the French particularly. And he's actually wounded at the Battle of Martinique in 1780. But right around this time, he also experiences a real loss, a real personal loss. His older brother Charles is killed at the Siege of Yorktown. He is a major in Cornwallis's army. And Co and uh, Cochrane feels this loss very deeply on a personal level and it will color his opinion of America and Americans for the rest of his life and the rest of his career. Now, during the American Revolutionary Wars, he does really well. He rises up the chain of command very fast. He's a good young officer. He's very skilled. He knows what he's about. And in 1783, he's made post-captain. And post-captain is the benchmark of success for any ambitious young officer. Because once you reach that rank, you will be an admiral. You just have to live long enough. Because promotion after that point is purely based on seniority. 
but the trouble was 1783 was also the year of peace. So it means that when he heads back to England, he's unemployed, he's on half pay, like thousands of other young officers, because the Navy demobilizes in peacetime at this time. And he stays unemployed until about 1790, when these new armed conflicts erupt with first Spain and then Russia, and they blow over pretty quickly. But thankfully, the French are there to mount an all-out war in 1793. Thank you, Frenchmen. Um, and the start of the French Revolutionary Wars in 1793. Well, Cochrane's immediately employed. They pull him back in, and they give him a really, really good command. He's put in charge of the Thetis. She's a very fast frigate. And he's given a small squadron of ships to take over to the American coast and to attack French convoys that are trading with America. And he does really, really well. Cochrane is, uh, he takes a lot of prizes. He actually makes a lot of money for himself uh, in prize money at this time. And he makes a name for himself. He becomes very successful. And his reputation is growing. And he also, probably most importantly, gets a really, really good working knowledge of the eastern coastline of the United States, which he'll certainly put to very good use in the next decade. Now, because of his uh, growing reputation, he's actually advanced to a big ship, a ship of the line, and he's given the 80-gun Ajax. And in 1800, uh, he's sent on, with this wonderful ship, he's sent on essentially a fool's errand. Um, he is part of a squadron that will take the exiled French loyalist army, royalist army too, that's uh, in Britain. He's going to take them back to the shores of France where they're going to mount another attack against the French Republican armies. Okay? Now, this is the second attempt to do this in 1800. And just like the first attempt, it's an abject failure. It's a disaster. But what Cochrane learns is the unique needs of what it takes to disembark an army and to work with army generals on these combined operations. Okay, combined operations being ones in which the Navy, the Army, and the Marines all have to work together for a common goal. And he, he gets a really good understanding of what it's all about, and he puts it to very good use the following year on the Egyptian coast. Because of his unique understanding of what it takes to mount a combined operation and his ability to work with army generals, which was not a very common skill in the Navy of the day, uh, he's put in charge of landing General Abercrombie's army at Abukir Bay in Ale near Alexandria on the Egyptian coast. And this is part of Abercrombie's last ditch effort to get the French out of Egypt. They need Egypt because it's strategically really important. It's a gateway to get to India, both overland and through access to shipping on the Red Sea. Okay? So Cochrane is given this really, really difficult task. He is sent to land 5,000 of Abercrombie's soldiers on this beachhead uh, at Abukir Bay. Uh, he's dealing with horrible wind and weather conditions at this time. And they're landing in a situation that's not unlike Omaha Beach in World War II. Napoleon has his uh, armies and his artillery embedded in these high dunes that border the beach. While the men are trying to come ashore, they're just firing down on the, on the landing parties. And also, they're having to deal with Abukir Castle, which is loaded up with French artillery. And they're firing grape shot and mortars down on the beach. Now, this is a pretty impossible situation to have to deal with, but Cochrane does really well. His strategies work. He ends up with only about 122 killed and about 500 wounded. Sounds like a lot, but in circumstances, it's actually pretty good statistics, pretty good butcher's bill. Um, and the campaign goes on to be very successful. Uh, the army goes on, they take Alexandria, and they get the French out of Egypt. Okay? It's a very good campaign. And although Abercrombie is killed on this campaign, the surviving army generals write back to 
uh, the government about Cochrane. They say how wonderful he was. I mean, they really wrap him up. They say, he displayed on this occasion a degree of skill and enterprise that stamped him as one of our ablest naval commanders. So his star again is rising and he is a really becoming an important player in the British Navy. Now, partly because of the British success in Egypt, the French sue for peace. It's this weird, brief, temporary piece of Amiens that happens in 1801 for about a year. Okay, no one really thinks it's going to hold any water, but they're at peace anyway. And during this brief peace, uh, he actually tries his hand at the other family business, which is politics. And uh, he does manage to get himself elected as MP for Renfrewshire, Dunfermline and Stirling, okay, uh, in, in Scotland. So he does really well, but trouble is, war erupts again in 1803. He's sent back to sea. He's not there to take care of his constituents and to coddle them. So he loses the election of 1806 to his political rival. And that's the only time he ever makes a foray into politics. Now, with the resumption of war, this is the start of the Napoleonic Wars, Napoleon's now first consul, Cochrane is given another great ship, the 74-gun Northumberland, and a small contingent of other vessels in his squadron. And he's given this really, really critical task. Essentially, what he is sent to do is to look in on the Bay of Ferrol, up here on the north coast of Spain. Now, Ferrol is strategically really important. Uh, first of all, there are five French warships bottled up in this bay, but... Spain, in 1803, beginning of 1804, she is still neutral. She has not gone into bed yet with France in the war against Great Britain. And 1804, the only thing on the minds of every Briton and the government of Great Britain is invasion. Napoleon's been threatening to invade for years and now it looks like he's actually going to do it. This is the greatest threat to hearth and home that the British have faced since 1066. Okay. But what France needs is help from Spain because they need the combined might of the Spanish and the French navies to overcome the British Navy, the wooden walls of Great Britain. So all of this, of course, is about the lead up to the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805, which we can talk about later. So Cochrane is sent to Ferrol to watch the ships and to see what's going on with Spain to be diplomatic, to use all those wonderful skills that he's got a reputation for, diplomacy, negotiation, being a pretty cool customer. Well, all those things go flying out the window right here and now. And his family's reputation for being volatile and temperamental and making enemies very easily, well, they all come to the fore for the first time in his naval career right here. And what happens is that relations with Spain break down completely in Ferrol. It's a, it's a mess. Now, keep in mind, Cochrane at this point has the ear of the First Lord of the Admiralty, he, Lord Melville, Henry Dundas. He's a fellow Scot. They're mates. And what Cochrane tells Melville is, look, these Spaniards are about to go into the war against us any minute. The only thing they are waiting on is the arrival of this really, really rich treasure convoy that's coming back from South America, laden with silver. And when the Spanish get the silver, it's going to reinvigorate their war chest and they're going to dive into this war against us, boots and all, full force. Well, Melville takes this information to the cabinet and they immediately respond by sending four heavily armed British frigates to take out the convoy. Now, the frigates do their job pretty well. Uh, they manage to take three of the treasure fleet captive, uh, very wealthy prizes they were too. But the fourth and largest ship in the fleet, she's blown up. They hit her magazine in the battle. Now, the trouble is that on board that ship that blew up were the wife and the daughters of the returning Spanish governor from the South American colony. Now, this is a diplomatic disaster. 
absolute nightmare because Britain's committed the ultimate sin. She has opened fire on a neutral convoy without warning and without a declaration of war, which you just did not do at this time. So essentially what they've done is they've forced Spain's hand. She now has to declare war on Great Britain. This is an act of war by Britain against her. So of course this happens. Now, no one believed that, Sp that Spain would stay out of the war with France. There were too many other political issues at stake. However, it was widely understood by senior people at the Navy and the government that Cochrane's interference didn't help. It made things a lot worse and it certainly expedited the situation. Now, there were comments in letters from Admiral Lord Nelson, who's commanding the Mediterranean fleet at the time. He's ticked off because now he has to mobilize immediately against a combined French and Spanish fleet. He's, he, he's in real trouble. So the Admiralty's like, oh my God, what are we gonna do with him? So the easiest thing to do, get rid of him. Get rid of Cochrane, get him out of the way. And essentially they send him into political exile in the West Indies, into professional exile, sorry. So get him out of Nelson's hair, get him out of the way of the, of the Spanish. But when he's out here, he's not a fool. He realizes he's messed up at Farol and he needs to make amends. And he is determined to do it with decisive actions against all the French possessions that are in the West Indies and against the possessions of their allies, the Dutch and the Danish at the time. And he goes about taking these islands with a, a, a vengeance. Uh, he takes uh, Saint-Domingue, the islands St. Croix, St. Thomas, St. Guia, St. Martin, uh, St. Lucia, Martinique is a big naval battle. Cochrane's actually nearly killed at this battle. And then finally in 1810, he takes Guadeloupe. Now he's, he's really successful with this campaign and all of these are combined operations. He's working with other admirals and army generals, especially Beckwith out here. Really successful. And he earns the trust of parliament once again. He's, he's officially thanked by parliament. He's given huge cash rewards for his services. He's made a member of the Order of the Bath. He's given uh, a knighthood. He's raised to the rank of Vice Admiral. And uh, actually, that should say Vice Admiral. Uh, and he is made Governor of Guadeloupe as a reward for his services. And that's a position he's going to hold until 1813 when his services are needed once again on the coast of the United States. Now, Throughout all of this, he's redeemed himself. He's brought himself back from the brink. Uh, he had a legacy now that he could be really proud of, and it had certainly been very hard won. Now, it's worth noting that when Cochrane entered the conflict with the United States, he took over from Admiral Warren, who was dismissed in January of 1814. He took over as Commander-in-Chief of the North America Station. That the whole complexion of the war with America changed completely with his arrival. And all of the senior naval and army staff, British staff who were on station in that area already, they're really grateful that he's there. Here's a man who brings energy and intelligence and understanding and knowledge of the coastline and a really clear view of where America is vulnerable. He has a very clear understanding of where she should be attacked. Back in 1812, before war was even declared against America, uh, he had written to the Admiralty to say, look, America is vulnerable at Virginia and at New Orleans. So now he's CNC, guess where he's going? He had a couple of different strategies uh, at work here. For New Orleans, his whole idea was uh, if you take control of the mouth of the Mississippi, then you're going to take control of the interior of the country. And he actually wrote uh, in his correspondence that uh, self-interest being the ruling principle with the Americans, those in the interior will join the party that pays for their produce. Okay. That party, of course, being Britain at the time because the largest market for the produce of the interior was the West Indies, now all British possessions. And he believed that this would help separate the interior from the eastern states that were waging war. 
in Virginia, he had two strategies. Number one was to free the black population, uh, to create an economic havoc in the area. And he actually did write in a letter that he believed he needed to free the black population because they were British in their hearts. Okay? Yeah. And then the other part of that strategy was to mount these flying attacks on uh, coastal cities, these kind of lightning war. Now, this uh, resulted, of course, in the successful capture of the capital and the burning of the White House and an unsuccessful attack on Fort McHenry near Baltimore. Now, General Ross, who was his uh, co-conspirator in these campaigns, they worked really well together. They were definitely on the same page. But Ross is killed two days before the battle at Fort McHenry by a sniper. And so the, the failure of that campaign falls entirely on Cochrane's head. It is, though, important to know that the British government and the Admiralty did not see Baltimore as a failure. They saw it as just a continuation of how we're prosecuting the war with the United States. Harassment, harassment, harassment. Harass them till they give up. That was the whole idea. But Cochrane personally, personally felt this as a failure. And he was absolutely determined after Baltimore to make amends with a successful and decisive victory at New Orleans. So that's where he's headed next. The entire campaign for the South, and specifically the attack on New Orleans, these were meticulously conceived operations. They were displaying an incredibly high degree of difficulty in terms of logistics, in terms of uh, moving men and material. Okay? He, he was really good at this. And when you look back at his long experience with campaigns from Kiberon Bay to Alexandria, Guadeloupe, Martinique, Chesapeake, you can start to understand why he would attempt such a difficult path to New Orleans as he did. The other thing I think it's important to note about him as a professional character is his ability to work with new information, okay, and to change his plans pretty much on a dime. There was this letter that I found recently from uh, Captain Sir Edward Codrington, who was one of his senior captains in Lake Bourne and the New Orleans campaign. And he's writing on December 15, which is the day after the Battle of Lake Bourne, to say that they are still planning to go through the Wrigley's and into Lake Pontchartrain and come down on New Orleans from the north. Now, that's December 15, that letter was written. When you think about the fact that on December 22nd, the first British boats were at the fishermen's camp at the mouth of Bayou Bienvenue, it shows that Cochrane was able to flip his strategies very, very quickly and change his whole plan based on that new intelligence. So he had a lot of creativity, a lot of ability to move quickly and to, to change with the times. Now, for the attack on New Orleans, Cochrane had to deal with a lot, a lot. He had to deal with a major intelligence leak at Jamaica before the fleet sailed for the Gulf Coast. He had a potentially devastating shortage of flat bottom boats to ferry all the men and material across Lake Bourne. And he had horrible weather conditions and frigid temperatures that wiped out large numbers of his regiments, particularly the, the West India regiments. And then he had this looming threat of peace that was going to come down. Okay? Everyone knew it was coming, it was just a matter of time. And it was no secret, no secret at all how he felt about the Americans. His idea, his need to give them a good drubbing, he wrote about, was a constant theme in his correspondence of the time, as was this sentiment where he says, if the peacemakers will only stay their proceedings until Jonathan, America, can be brought to the feet of Great Britain, future wars will be prevented. And he absolutely believed this. But this belligerence, this desire for more war, a continuation of the war, was absolutely at odds with the way the British people felt about this conflict. 
the War of 1812 had never been popular in Great Britain. Not at all, and for really good reasons. Number one was the idea that it was a distraction from the real war against France. This is an existential war against Napoleon, a, a war that threatens the existence of Great Britain. And why are we sending men and material off to the United States? The other reason it was unpopular was the British weren't doing so well. Okay, they weren't having any of these great victories that would have made it potentially more popular. And then the third reason is actually something you see in letters to the editors of major London newspapers throughout 1813 and really strongly throughout 1814. This idea that in America we are fighting our own. We're fighting our cousins. Okay, we're of the same stock is a common phrase that's used in these letters. And it was an immoral war, therefore. Now, by December of 1814, these letters to the editors of the big newspapers, the Gazette, the Lloyd's Evening Post, even the Naval Chronicle, they are becoming absolutely vicious towards the naval and army commanders in chief in charge of the war in America. Really, really strongly worded, very vitriolic. And uh, it's all about the idea we need to get out. Uh, General Prevost up in Canada, he is blasted in these letters and for losing up in Canada, despite the fact that Wellington has sent him 20,000 additional troops to help him out. And then after the losses in Fort McHenry and at New Orleans, well, all the army generals are dead. So Cochrane receives the full force of this public uh, disparagement. He's really uh, in deep trouble. So his legacy is completely affected by the fact that A, he didn't die in battle, and B, he didn't win those battles. Okay? And I think it's fairly safe to surmise that if Pakenham had survived at Chalmette, he too might have ended up on the wrong side of history. And I think Ron alluded to some of that earlier today about the decisions that were made. So, now it's important to, I think, understand that he did not receive any kind of official reprimand from the government or from the Admiralty for his efforts. After all, they'd sanctioned all of his decisions in the US. But it is telling to look at what happened to him afterwards. In 1815, when he returns home after the peace, he's unemployed. And he remains unemployed until 1821 when uh, he's given a position as CNC of Plymouth Dockyard, a desk job. He never gets to go back and serve at sea again, and he's only 58 years old at this point. He's certainly old enough to be commanding as an admiral at sea. Now, excuse me. Oops, backwards. So, just to finish up, the, the men who wrote the early histories of the Navy of Great Britain in the Napoleonic Wars and the War of 1812, uh, Edward Brenton and William James, they almost completely left Cochrane out of the, the stories of both of these wars. And that's why I've called him the Forgotten Admiral, because to this day, no one has written a biography or even a good article for that matter about this really interesting and really complex man who won big and lost just as big. He was daring and brilliant and logistically savvy, creative, able to work with people. And then at the same time, he was bigoted and short-sighted and uh, temperamental and myopic when it came to dealing with an enemy, be it French or Spanish or American. So whatever way you want to feel about Cochrane, the one thing you can't do is deny the impact that he had on the way two great wars played out. Thank you.